Next on the docket, we're going to I'm going to read you the first page of this text by Merce Eliade. I'll put it up on the screen. And um, the first paragraph of this text is just, it's fantastic. I use this in many of my courses. I assigned this entire text for many of my courses in the past. But to be honest, it's not really meant for undergraduate students, and it is quite challenging. Nevertheless, it contains so many important ideas and important concepts, and so I wanted to at least give you an introduction to it, and especially read this first paragraph, because the first paragraph, which is most of the first page, is really fantastic, and will give you a, it will really give you a good introduction to what we mean by myth and ways to approach myth in religious studies and theology from a particular vantage where we're trying to really put ourselves in someone else's shoes and think about how myth, especially cosmogonic myths, myths of origin, myths of beginning, myths, myths of the beginning of the cosmos, the ganos, the generation of the cosmos, how these function in the lives of people. So let me just jump in and start reading. It is not without fear and trembling that a historian of religion approaches the problem of myth. This is not only because of that preliminarily embarrassing question, what is intended by myth? It is also because the answers given depend for the most part on the documents selected by the scholar. From Plato and Fontenelle to Schelling and Boltmann, philosophers and theologians have proposed innumerable definitions of myth. But all of these have one thing in common. They are based on the analysis of Greek mythology. Now, for a historian of religions, this, is, this choice is not a very happy one. It is true that only in Greece did myth inspire and guide epic poetry, tragedy, and comedy, as well as the plastic arts. But it is no less true that it is especially in Greek culture that myth was subjected to a long and penetrating analysis from which it emerged radically demythicized. In other words, he's saying that Greek myths are not myths because the mythic aspect of the Greek myths has been taken out of it through analysis and whatnot. If in every European language the word myth denotes a fiction, it is because the Greeks pro proclaimed it to be such 25 centuries ago. What is even more serious for an historian of religion, we do not know a single Greek myth within its ritual context. So just as I gave you in the previous section, myth needs to have three things, right? It needs to be a story with a particular truth told in a particular context. So Eliade here is saying that the Greek myths, with which we're very familiar, we don't know their original context, and they've been, even though they've been passed down and analyzed throughout the centuries, the mythic aspect of it, the part that makes it a living myth, has been removed um, through analysis because everyone knows that they are fiction. Of course, this is not the case with the Paleo, Oriental, and Asiatic religions. It is especially not the case with the so called primitive religions. As is well known, a living myth is always connected with a cult. Again, by cult he means, you know, something cultural, something habitual, something that is imbibed in the culture as part of a regular practice, such as, you know, maybe a story that you tell every time somebody gets married, a story that you tell at every funeral, a story that you tell, a story that you tell at every New Year's or at every harvest festival like Thanksgiving. So, as is well known, a living myth is always connected with a cult, inspiring and justifying a religious behavior. None of this, of course, means that Greek myth should not figure into an investigation of the mythical phenomenon, but it would seem unwise to begin our kind of inquiry by the study of Greek documents, and even more so to restrict it to such documents. The mythology which informs Homer, Hesiod, and the tragic poets represents already a selection of an interpretation of archaic materials, some of which had become almost unintelligible, meaning that they didn't, even they didn't know the context from which it emerged, and even they, Hesiod and these other playwrights and Homer, even they, the, the myths were archaic, they were already quite old by the time that they came to Homer and Hesiod, so even they didn't know the original context for many of these myths. And here's the most important sentence. 
In short, our best chance of understanding the structure of mythical thought is to study cultures where myth is a living thing, where myth constitutes the very ground of the religious life. In other words, where myth, far from indicating a fiction, is considered to reveal the truth par excellence. So, what is Eliade saying here? He's saying something very similar to what I said earlier, because I'm very influenced by this text and by Eliade. But he's saying that myth, we want to understand how myth functions within a particular community of humans, then we need to consider how those myths are told. In what context are they told? How do those myths inform every decision in that person's life? How do they, how does it shape their understanding of themselves and their place in this world? So if we want to understand cosmogonic myths, myths of origin, myths of beginning, myths of creation, then we need to understand them within their context. And what matters is not whether or not even those people consider the myth to be true or some kind of history, but instead how that myth shapes their understanding of themselves and how it influences their daily practices, the major decisions in their lives, where they go to college, what career they pursue, how they understand themselves and their purpose within the world. So we need to look at living myths within their context in order to understand what a myth actually does, how it functions, what this phenomenon of myth does to human persons. So on the next page, Eliade talks about this uh, myth called the Enuma Elish myth. Enuma Elish, which I have written here, Enuma Elish is a story, we're going to study it in a bit more detail when we get to Rosemary Red for Bruther a bit later in the semester. It's really important to understand the context of um, Genesis 1 and some other texts. The only thing I want to mention about Enuma Elish now is that this is a cosmogonic myth. It's a story of creation, the beginning of everything. And it, the, this story is a particularly violent story, as we'll see. It involves a god named Marduk, who basically kills his mother. Not basically. He does kill his mother, named Tiamat, and then turns her body into the world. And King kills his father, Kingu, and uses his blood and her body in order to make humans out of clay and out of blood. And the reason Marduk makes humans is just to, to free the gods up for leisure. So basically, humans are created for work, for labor, in order to serve the gods. Humans are created as slaves. Now, the point here, the reason I even mention it now, is not only because Eliade does, but because this is a myth that functions how people understand themselves, particularly if you are a slave owner and you are telling the story to your slaves, then, you know, that just says, hey, you, this whole universe, we were all created, all humans were created to be slaves or servants, and so I'm serving God by just being your slave master, but actually I'm just serving God too. It's not a very good story. But what Eliade points out is that an Enuma Elish myth is one that was told every year at New Year's. He writes, At every New Year, the fabulous events related in, in Enuma Elish were ritually reenacted. Every year, the world needed to be recreated. So New Year's is a time of, it's a new year, it's a new beginning, it's a new cosmogony, it's a time of recreation, it's a like old Lang Syne, right? Let old acquaintances be forgot. Let everything in the bad, like everything that happened last year be forgotten except for the good things that we want to continue. So it's a time for starting over, for cleaning the slate, right? Erasing everything and starting over. And when you start over, then you need to go back to those myths of origins and retell them to recall that creation is being recreated all the time, particularly on an annual basis. The cycles of you know, winter and spring, summer and fall. So we have these cycles of spring where everything comes back to back to life and summer where everything's flourishing and fall when things begin to die and go back to dormant states. And then winter where there's not much life around and then everything comes back again the next new year, the next spring. 
as Eliade points out, one of the main reasons that we should be studying cosmogonic myths, myths of origin, myths of creation or beginning, as we are in this course, is because, as Eliade writes, the cosmogonic myth furnishes the model for all myths of origins. So any other myths of origins within a particular culture or community, any, anywhere there are humans that have myths of, of origin, which all, all humans do, those myths of origin shape and influence how all other myths of origins are portrayed. Eliade goes on to note that mythology is considered at once a true history. It relates how things came into being, providing the exemplary model and also the justifications of man's activity, particularly, he notes, death and sex. So we will see these themes come up frequently all semester, death and sex. Death is the beginning of philosophy, and sex is always accompanying discourses about death, because sex is the only way to overcome death, right? Through sex, you have reproduction, a recreation, a creation of a new being, which then hopefully, outlives oneself. So the only way to overcome death in a real sense in our world is through sex and procreation. So the procreation, the creation of another, overcomes to some extent the death of me, right? It's a continuation of my DNA. It's a continuation, yeah, it's a continuation of my DNA. So Eliade goes on to um, discuss this tribe called the Dayak, who live in Borneo, and their cosmogonic myths. And he's trying to give sort of a, you know, just a sampling of the various kinds of cosmogonic myths and the way that, the sort of flavor or the feel that they have. And in this Dayak uh, myth, it's a myth that involves conflict, a conflict between a man and a woman. At the beginning, there's a coiled snake, and then it turns into two and then these two are at odds with each other, kind of fighting at each other, and they eventually kill each other. But from that union of these male and female, even though it's a, con a, a, it's a story of conflict, um, then leads to a procreation and a generation of humans, etc. But as Eliade points out, this is a story that is told particularly at marriages. So the the marriage, the union of two, they tell this cosmogonic myth because in many ways the, the cosmogony began with sex, began with union of male and female, and likewise a marriage begins that cycle anew, right? It begins the cycle of sex and recreation, procreation again and again and again. So these myths of creation and recreation and procreation, sex and death, are told at the times of marriage ceremony. It's been, uh, you know, here speaking specifically of the Dayak um, tribes in Borneo. As Eliade writes, from destruction and death spring the cosmos and a new life. The new creation originates in the death of the total Godhead. Birth, initiation, marriage, and death. Everything which is significant in the eyes of a Dayak is an imitation of the exemplary models and a repetition of the events narrated in the cosmic myth. Repetition may not be quite the right word. Maybe today we might say something like a meme, right? It's a mimesis, to use Aristotle's version of the word meme, but a mimesis, a copy that's not quite a copy, a variation on a theme, like a fugue or something, right? So it's the same, but not quite the same. It's the same, but new. It's the same, but in a new context with new people, etc. He continues, the wedding is the reenactment of the creation, and the reenactment of the creation is the creation of the first human couple from the tree of life. Furthermore, the end of the year signifies an end of an era and also the end of a world, right? A new world is going to supersede it, but this world is over, this year is over, this season is over, this cycle is over, and we're beginning a new cycle. So then we want to decide what we want to carry into that new year, what we want to be different, what we want to be the same, what we want to never remember again. I'll skip over most of this, which has to do with orgies. Uh, orgies tend to be, um, I assume you know what an orgy is, but orgies tend to be quite common during New Year celebrations, these periods of renewal and where 
what's in religious studies we call an interstitial period, a period between the old and the new, that between the death of the old and the birth of the new, there is this orgiastic, set, orgiastic interstitial period, sort of a liminal space that's not quite last year and not quite next year, but something in between where all the normal rules are suspended and before things go back to normal, there's sort of a play and a creativity and, you know, a celebration of just what it is to be. In, in Greek terms, we call that sort of the Dionysian, right? Like Nietzsche's The Gay Science, the, the frivolity, the play, the celebration of life, the joie de vivre, the joy of life. All right, now let's move on to the Arandas. So let's move over here and turn on the lights and we're going to move over to the different part of the room and talk about the Aranda. So part of Eliade's point is that cosmogonic myths are somewhat paradigmatic. Paradigmatic. Cosmogonic myths are paradigmatic. Paradigmatic means that they, they kind of set a particular paradigm, right? Like a pattern. Here's the first pattern, and then everything after that kind of repeats that pattern on variations on a theme, right? Memes and, yeah, memes. That's, that should work. And so he's trying to look at various paradigms from human cultures, like different cosmogonic myths and how those paradigms function within human cultures and human societies. And so the next example that he takes comes from the Aranda, which are also called the Arante. This is a group of indigenous tribes in Central Australia, sometimes called Aborigines, right? They're indigenous people. So the Arande or the Arante, I'll put up a couple of pictures. You can also find them on Wikipedia. It's actually where I got them. It's a society of people that don't wear clothes and live in Central Australia. And they're very, very, very ancient. They've been following the same traditions, the same teachings, the same practices for millennia, as long as we can imagine, really. Eliade says, Indeed, the events that took place in the mythical times, in the dream time, which is the, what the Arandas call it, are religious in the, sen in the sense that they constitute a paradigmatic history which man has to follow and repeat over and over again, right? But not exact repetition, but like a meme. So they have to follow and repeat in order to assure the continuity of the world, of life, and of society. So these are the acts of creation which must be recreated over and over and over again. Gosh, that sounds familiar. Where have I heard that? Creation, creativity, and recreation. I think that's the title of the course. So it is the title of the course because we are looking at cosmogonic myths throughout this semester and trying to see cosmogonic myths from a variety of different perspectives, kind of like a phenomenology. It's like a 3D phenomenology. All right, so let's talk about, we've already talked about a couple of cosmologies, what we talked about, the Enuma Elish, very briefly, we'll come back to it, the Dyadic of Borneo, very, very briefly, you could always read that, I'll post the Eliade's text if you want to read it and know more. To a certain extent, the story of Rosa Parks, too, is part of our cosmogony, right? It's how did we get here, the stories and history that have shaped our current context, that without those people or those events or those stories, our world would be different than it is now. So those stories and those events and those personages have created the world in which we live now, which we are called to either recreate exactly as it is or recreate with something different, like, I don't know, more justice or more equality or something like that. So let's just talk about the Aranda for a minute. So the Aranda have this um, wonderful creation story, very detailed cosmogonic myths, which Eliade goes into a bit of detail about, and you can certainly find many other sources that talk about it in greater detail. By the way, Eliade, as far as I know, never went to Australia. He didn't study these people himself. His source is a man named Strelo, and Strelo was the son of a missionary, and he Strelo was actually born in this, um, in this community, raised there. It was his first language his first language was the Aranda language because he was the son of a missionary who was there to convert these people. But he wound up living there for 30 years and studying these people, and he grew up in that. This was 
I mean, he's obviously not an Aranda, but he's kind of as close as a white guy can get to being an Aranda. And so Eliade had a great respect for him as a scholar and as a, as a, as a reliable source of information about these communities. Nevertheless, for our purposes today, I'll just kind of give a quick overview of their cosmogonic myth. So it all begins with Canary Jub. Sorry, I keep burping because, uh, you know, Abby's Blue Hole beer is deeper and wetter and apparently burpier. It all begins with Canary Jub, basically means the Great Father. However, this Great Father, the Father that created the universe, doesn't actually live on Earth and doesn't seem to have any interest in Earth whatsoever. This God that created the universe and all the stars lives in the celestial realm and doesn't even seem to know that we're down here or care that we're down here. The Great Father is off with his children, because he's a father, and, you know, doing their own thing. They're also called the eternally young, the perpetually young. So he's very young. He looks as young as his children. And anyway, they're just doing whatever they're doing. They're not really, they're not really present in the lives of the Aranda. The Great Father just doesn't even seem to know that the Aranda are here or care, right? The Great Father is way out there. Deus Odiosus, which just means like a hidden God, an absent God, a God that just creates and then leaves. I don't know. I think today we'd say like a deadbeat dad, right? Like someone who just like creates and then doesn't even know, doesn't even, doesn't even know, but is just off doing his own thing and is absent. Far more important for the Aranda are the Altir Jirana and Mbakala. Basically, these totemic ancestors, these ancestors, totemic, basically like spiritual or mythical, I think mythical would work, but the mythical ancestors, the ancestors of the stories, the ancestors, these ancient ancestors, the ones who came before. In the Aranda cosmogony, the Great Father, as I said, just creates the world or creates the universe, lives up in the heavens and doesn't even seem to know that we're here or doesn't seem to care what's going on, has no association, no anything. Far more important are the Altijarana and Nambakala, the totemic ancestors. And in the stories that the Arandas tell to their children, um, they tell all these great stories about the ancestors and what they did and how they gave shape to the environment, how they created this atmosphere, how they took the land that was already here, the land that was created by the Great Father, whether he knew or cared or whatever, or anything, just like poof, it was there. But the ancestors are the ones who emerged from underground and they looked around and they began to make things. They began to take what was there and recreate it, shape it into the environment, shape it into the trees, shape it into shape it into the surroundings that the Aranda live in today. So it's these ancestors that are the real heroes of the story, right? Now, as Eliade explains, such works constitute, properly speaking, a cosmogony. Cosmogony is that's the million dollar word of the day, right? Cosmogony is the generation, the ganos, the genesis, the beginning of the cosmos, the order in which we live. So such works, the works of the totemic ancestors, they are what constitute a cosmogony. The ancestors did not create the earth. Now here I should pause and say that, you know, Eliade, Eliade is using the word create here in a very narrow, sort of very Christian understanding of creation out of nothing. He means they don't create out of nothing, right? The ancestors did not, poof, create something out of nothing. They didn't create the earth, but they gave form to a pre-existent materia prima of Eliade and his Latin, a prime material, material that was there before they got there. So Kanarjita just sort of like, poof, the universe is here. Then the ancestors come along and they take what was there, which was just, you know, sort of chaotic and disorderly, and they begin to give shape to it. They gave form to the pre-existent matter. Eliade continues, and the anthropogony repeats the cosmogony. Anthropogony, the beginning of man, right, the origins of human persons. 
um, repeats the cosmogony. Some of the totemic ancestors took on the roles of culture heroes, slicing apart the semi-embryonic aggregate, then shaping each individual infant by slitting the webs of his fingers and toes and cutting open his ears, eyes, and mouth. Other culture heroes taught men how to make tools and fire, how to cook food, and they also revealed social and religious institutions to them. Think about that, right? The Deus Odiosus, this hidden god, this god that just sort of poof, brings everything into being, however it does it, right, has no sort of associate, doesn't know or care about what's going on down here. But those ancestors, those ones who came before us, they're the ones that took the time and the care and the patience to slit the, um, right, if you think about like um, webs, I think if you, you know, if you look at an embryo, a human embryo, when it's in the womb, at some point there, we have webbed fingers, right? As our hands are forming, the webs in the fingers, and then, you know, as the human embryo develops, then those webs go away. But here, the, the totemic ancestors for the Aranda are seen cutting, right? Cutting those webs, just the care and the attention that goes into that, right, of each individual kind of giving shape to each individual, cutting the webs between their fingers, opening the holes of their ears so we can hear, opening the holes in their eyes so that we can see, giving shape to matter, giving form to matter, but doing so with a great deal of care and love, right? Then there's a little bit more about orgies, but then Eliade starts talking about the initiation ceremony. So an initiation ceremony is something that is quite ubiquitous throughout human culture. Almost every culture has some sort of rite of initiation. In fact, the American culture is one of the few that doesn't have many. Um, what we're talking about here is puberty, right? Coming of age, developing secondary sex characteristics, right? becoming aware of oneself as a sexual being and learning what sex is. That entrance into adulthood in religious study circles like mine are referred to as an initiation ceremony, right? So just as you might be initiated into a fraternity or a sorority, likewise, people go through rituals in order to be initiated into adulthood. So we might think of like bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs. Anyway, here's what matters for our purposes. At this initiation ceremony, right? When the Arandas reach a coming of age, when boys and girls become men and women, they go through this initiation ceremony, this initiation process. And throughout their entire childhood, they've been told all of these stories about the Alterajana Nambakala, this, these totemic ancestors. The ancestors did this, the ancestors did that, the ancestors carved the fingers you know, cut the webs between your fingers, they opened your ears, they opened your eyes, they opened your nostrils. The ancestors did all of these things for you, but the ancestors also did all of these things in the world, right? They gave shape to our landscape. They built these mountains, they gave, they planted these trees, they created the world here and now around us, right? We're not talking about on the other side of the world or whatever. Talking about the world, everything that you see here, those ancestors gave shape to. Those are the stories that are told from birth up until initiation, right? And then when a, when a child reaches initiation and they go through the proper ceremonies in the Aranda culture, as Eliade explains, then they go through this ritual, and in the ritual they are told... You are a reincarnation of those ancestors. You are not different than those ancestors. Those ancestors weren't people who lived long ago. Those people who, those are people, the ancestors are people who are perpetually reborn, reincarnated, and you are one of them. Right? You can't get more cosmogonic than that. Right? The beginning, the world in which we live, the roads, the houses, the 
streets, the government, the laws, the constitution, the everything, right? Everything around us was shaped by our ancestors. And now you are one of those ancestors. It's up to you to recreate the world, right? Are you going to take the kind of care that the ancestors did to carve the, you know, to um, cut the webs between our fingers and to open the ears and that sort of love and attention and care that go that re is required to be an ancestor? Or are you just going to fuck it all up, right? Are you going to be like the slacker that breaks the chain? Or are you going to be the demon that we will tell stories about later? Or are you going to take all of those stories that you heard as a child about those totemic ancestors and now recognize, now it's my turn, right? Now it's up to me to create the world for the next generation, right? This is the meaning. This is the point. So... You have inherited this world which has been created. Sure, it was created at some point by Knarja, this, um, this great father who can do magical things like invent the universe and cause this big bang and all that kind of stuff. But that that dude, he's a deus eriosus. Who knows where he is? He doesn't even care about us, right? Who cares about us are the ancestors, the one who shaped this land, that shaped this earth, and you are one of those. You are those ancestors reborn, reincarnated. Will you do the same things that you did before and perform the same duty for those who come after you? Or are you just going to fuck it all up? So, Eliade says, the ancestors reincarnate themselves perpetually. The immortal soul of each individual represents a particle of an ancestor's life. More about orgies. Eliade continues, in this mythical time, post time of the totemic ancestors, man became what he is today, not only because he was then shaped and instructed by the ancestors, but also because he has to repeat continuously everything that the ancestors did. The myths disclosed the sacred and creative history. Through initiation, every young Aranda not only learns what happened in the beginning, but ultimately discovers that he was already there, that somehow he participated in those glorious events. The initiation brings about an anamnesis, anamnesis, uh, amne like, you know the word amnesia, right, forgetting, and an amnesia is an unforgetting, the unforgetting. So those that information was already there because you are that ancestor. But the initiation causes this unforgetting where you remember now that you are part of that tradition. And now it is your turn as an adult member of this community, right? Initiation into adulthood. Becoming an adult means recognizing that it's your turn to become a future ancestor. That's more than enough on Eliade. Uh, there are many different points here. I will, I will absolutely keep bringing Eliade in this text up frequently in the lessons that are contained in this lecture. But for now, let's just take another break, and then I'll wrap things up, and you can go and smoke a bowl.